I'm going to give a sermon this morning, um, and uh, about a, a year or so ago, I gave a series called A Church for the World, and uh, I put together uh, quite a few of these talks about what I really believe the church needed to think about in terms of how do we actually construct and be ourselves in a way that uh, front loads the idea of we're loving the world and we're not just thinking about ourselves. And so... Uh, I'm going to beg your indulgence, or uh, just, I'm going to do another one, because I've been thinking about it, and I thought, okay, this one needs to be talked about as well, and I'm going to give another caveat here. This is kind of an insider talk, so if you're not a church person, welcome to the party. You'll get, get a chance to hear me berate the church. How's that? Okay, I'm not going to do that, but, okay, can we do some jumping jacks or something? I feel like uh, kind of a non-responsive. So uh, I was going to do a little breakout thing, but I'm just going to jump into it. And a, a few weeks ago, I shared a story uh, of an experience I had, and I just alluded to it in a talk, but I want to give you a little bit bigger picture of what happened. You need to know that I'm not like a pro pastor because I don't have an office or anything. I work out of my house. And uh, I'm a remarkably distractible person. Anybody that's been around me long, knows that's true, and I've built systems to help me stay on task and do my best to stay focused. I've, I've actually discovered some really cool things. If you're ADHD, uh, come and talk to me. I can help you. I've discovered something. Can't do it right now, though. <laughs> um, the day, which was about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, maybe, it was like almost every other day, and I heard a knock on my door, and I don't know what happens to you when you get a knock on your door in the middle of the day, but a couple things happened in my head. Number one, I thought, finally, a guilt-free reason to break my focus. Maybe it's the UPS driver who is AKA Santa for me, and he's gonna bring something really cool that I can you know, celebrate with. But the other thing that comes to mind is, uh, I get really nervous when someone knocks on my door at 10 a.m., and it's usually somebody's who are doing door-to-door -door sales stuff. It still happens. They're, that's still alive and well. And I can be honest with you at this point that I've become pretty callous to people knocking on my door and trying to sell me stuff. You can ask Robbie how uh, non-Christian I can be. On this day, though, it was the second, but it was actually a little bit worse. There were two men, one younger, and one older, probably middle age, and there was a middle-aged woman stand about 20 feet back, and she was standing here like this, and it felt like she was a, a shift supervisor, you know, making sure that the two people that hit the door did their jobs and didn't choke. And uh, she was very grave, she made me nervous. It, it, was, it was like she was watching the two guys to ensure they didn't mess up, and the two guys wasted no time getting right to what they wanted to do. And I actually appreciated that because I, di I didn't want to spend a lot of time at the door anyway. Uh, and uh, I immediately knew what was coming. Uh, someone knocking at my door at 10 a.m., breaking my uh, focus cocoon and uh, trying to convert me to Christianity. They would try to get me to religiously and con convert on my front steps by saying the sinner's prayer. Okay, before I go any further, I cannot and will not cast aspersions on them. As I said before, I've done this type of thing in the past, and if they were anything like me, they put themselves in a position because they actually really love Jesus. They actually do love Jesus, and they had a conviction that this was something they were really supposed to do. Also, they were not just a little stressed, and the only reason I know that is because I've done this before too. And if you go to someone's door and knock on it, thinking you're going to talk to them, I, I felt convicted I was supposed to do it, but I was pretty sure everyone I talked to would resent me that I was bugging them cold turkey on their porch. In other words, I assumed that they felt a little bit like me. So the older guy, uh, who was probably in his 40s, he began with a quick introduction, and he said, my name is John. Now I have to pause for a minute because I don't really know if it was John. I didn't listen to his name because I was assessing the situation. You know, he was, t he could have been George or Ben or whatever, but I was in full assessment mode because you need to do that at 10 a.m. at your front door. And he said, 
I'm from First Baptist Church. Again, I have no idea if that's the real church. I made that up because I was assessing the situation. He wasted no time, though. He went right into it. This is what he said. We're here wondering if you've ever considered Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Because I was a seasoned door knocker, I felt the liberty to stop him and relieve him of his anxiety. I knew what he was after. I interrupted him by saying, oh, thanks, guys. I'm a Christian already. In fact, and I thought this would put this whole thing to bed, I said, I'm actually a pastor. I honestly thought that would settle it. <laughs> I was very wrong. It was like he never heard a word I said. Wait, he didn't hear a word I said. He didn't listen to me even one moment. He took another gulp of air, and he went into his spiel, which was, do you know that you are a sinner and you need Jesus Christ to save you? <laughs> now, in my mind, <laughs> I went back to the days when I would practice evangelism in this way, and I, would, I have done almost the same thing, but I would be more savvy. I would have been more forceful with my question, and it would be this. Ready? If you were to die tonight, and uh, you would meet God, and he were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you tell him? That's the diagnostic question that we would use. And um, if uh, the person uh, wasn't sure, you'd go into some other uh, explanation of the gospel. Uh, but for me, if he would have asked me that, I would have said this. I know that I'm a sinner. I put my trust in Jesus Christ alone, confess Jesus as my, with my mouth, believe in my heart. I have absolute confidence that I would be led into heaven. Then it would be put to bed. Instead, uh, because I'm an insensitive, semi-cold-hearted person at the door, I just said, hey, look, I'm good. <laughs> you know, may maybe he would go away. And as firmly as I... Uh, could, I began to shut the door and simply said, thanks for your concern, and it was over. As I went back to work, though, I was kind of overwhelmed by a couple things. Number one, that there was no affect. There was no emotion to it. It was almost like he was a robot going through a script. And that comes off a little judgy, uh, but that's what happened, and it's a shame. The second thing was that he wasn't all that concerned about being a witness, but rather the task of converting me. I know because I was him. I wanted to check the box. I wanted to give a testimony at church the next week that I checked the box. I led somebody to become a Christian that they converted while I was there. It wasn't that there was not good motives. It's just that his good motives were subsumed into... Um, the task of converting me. So, that leads me to tell you why I'm giving this talk today. And here it is. I think God has called us to be witnesses, but not necessarily people who call for conversion or look to convert people. That might sound subtle, but I truthfully believe if we're to be a church for the world, it makes a ton of, a dif ton of difference. Let me tell you why. Uh, first of all, um, we shouldn't make it our aim to convert others. Nowhere in Scripture, that I'm aware of at least, does it hint that that's our job. It doesn't tell us that that's our target. We need to go convert people. Although there is the Matthew 28 thing, go make disciples, which is a little forceful. And then there's the story of the banquet table where they go out, go out and no one comes back to, to eat the meal. So the master says, this is King James, by the way, go out into the fields and compel them to come. That's pretty forceful. But besides that, I'm with people like Leslie Newbegin, and we'll, I'll shoot this up here. Evangelism is telling of the telling of good news, but what changes people's minds and converts their wills is always a mysterious work of the sovereign Holy Spirit, and we are not permitted to know more than a little of this secret work. Or the venerable John Stott said it this way, to evangelize does not mean to win converts, but simply to announce the good news irrespective of results. Jesus said it this way, John chapter 6, no one can come to me unless the Father draws them. In other words, I can't make somebody do anything. He says in 
uh, John 6, 65, he says it again. Therefore, I've said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted for him to come by my Father. Though sincere, it brings out, if we try to convert people, it brings out the very opposite of what we're hoping for. It changes the, 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 the playbook. What we're trying to do is communicate that God loves people, that he died for their sin, and that he, he actually cares. But when we go into conversion mode, a lot of things can happen. And if you've ever tried this kind of thing, you're right here with me. But here, here, let me just give you a list of some things. Number one, you can become very manipulative. You can move into a relationship, not necessarily out of love, but out of uh, duty and this is what I'm trying to, to accomplish, a goal. It can be very disrespectful. It can actually even bring trauma to people. Let me tell you a quick story. A few years ago, but I don't know if you're, anybody ever went to the Empyrean coffee shop when it's downtown, raise your hand. Two, three, four, five. Okay, it's been a while, but I was sitting in the Empyrean, which is right adjacent to CityGate, which is a downtown church that ministers to people without houses. Right? And I was sitting there having a cup of coffee, uh, chatting with whoever would talk to me, you know, because I'm just chatty. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, this guy who's like about 40 years old comes in with a guitar. Now, I was curious, uh, but it, there's a lot of people walking around downtown with guitars. But this isn't one of the downtown guitar people. This was a guy that came from someplace else with his guitar, and I presumed that he was over at CityGate ministering, and he was done at this point, and he had come into the coffee shop for a quick coffee. He was full of energy, uh, emotion, and apparently he was not done with his ministry task um, because he saw a young man sitting by himself in the corner who was obviously trying to be by himself, and abruptly the middle-aged guy moved across the shop and engaged the other person. Now, again, I, I'm really trying to keep this balanced so it doesn't come off like I'm just ticked or something. But I, I want to avoid stereotyping, and, I want, and I'm sure the person felt convicted again to do this. But he cornered this young guy and began to try to convert him. And I'm hesitant just to play a replay of the first story as I began, but I could. He had one thing on his mind, conversion. And I'll just say this, it was completely unfair, and there was a power dynamic involved as well. There was, an, there was a middle-aged man coming in and cornering like an 18-year-old kid in the corner of this coffee shop. What made me almost cry, though, was after he was gone, the young man went up to the counter, visibly shaken, looking for solace from the barista. And honestly, guys, the only words I could hear, and like my brain turned off, it turned into some sort of surreal experience. He went up, and you could tell he was just out of sorts. And this is what he said to the barista. I feel like I was just socially raped. It gets worse. If we have a conversion as our target, rather than just being a witness, uh, we have things socially and even uh, uh, across the world like colonization happened for this very reason. Now, it's maybe been overstated of what colonization has done because not everybody did it, but many, many, many nations did this. Charlemagne, uh, in 1493, the Pope gave permission to Charlemagne that it was your right, the Spanish and the Portuguese explorers, it was your right to colonize, convert, and to enslave in the name of God. There were indigenous people who were forced to convert in our country. Now listen, we can try to ignore these acts, but if we allow them to be ignored, uh, we're susceptible to repeat them. And I'm going to take, take a moment, and I'm going to slide over here. This is not my sermon, but it's related. It's why I'm concerned about what's happening in parts of our country to remove the brutal history of slavery. One particular person, which I won't mention, 
alluded to the fact that slavery actually prepared enslaved people to be able to function in trades once slavery was eradicated. This is a headline, not from a, a, a far right or far left news outlet. This is ABC News headline. Florida's new black history curriculum says slaves develop skills so they could be used for personal benefit. That's what's being exchanged for real history in our country right now. Can I just be straight with you and I'll move back to my sermon? There's nothing that can explain slavery except pure evil. We can have control over certain things, but we have to know what we can have control over. Converting the soul is not one of those things. We can have a control over how our community is assigned to the world. We can have control whether we are trustworthy with the story of the gospel. We can have control of the invitation. We need to invite people into that. We can have control of our reliance on Jesus. We have to orient our life, however, so that the message we declare makes sense, living in a way that always leads to love. Living in a way that is not afraid to testify. Here's what we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to act. Not, necessar not, not necessarily to convert, but to witness. Mm -hmm. Acts 1, chapter 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's what we're commanded to do. We are to be witnesses. Don't, don't hear me say that we're not supposed to engage the world with the gospel. But we have to stay in our lane. One of the best examples I know in the Bible is uh, of a witness is in John chapter 1 uh, verses 1 through 8. I'm going to read the whole passage. I'll explain why in one moment. And you've read this. This is John's prologue. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. By the way, the Word, we find out in verse 14, was, is Jesus. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of humanity. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He only came as a witness to the light. Let me give you three observations, and I'm going to be fast here. The first thing we have to observe, in verse 6 it says there was a man sent from God. John was sent. The actual word, the root for the word sent here is apostello. It's the word we get once sent with a message. If you translate it into Latin, that's the word missio. That's where we get our word mission. Someone sent to go somewhere on purpose. But we have to ask, sent to do what? What was John sent to do? Well, one thing we know, there's an allusion to Isaiah in Mark chapter 1, and it says, John, excuse me, John the Baptist came to make straight the way for the Lord. Now, just hold that for a minute. If we're to think about ourselves as a church for the world, we have to ask, the question, ask ourselves the question, are we making the way straight or are we making it crooked? Because I'm not sure that's a clear answer for a lot of people. We are to emulate the life of Christ. And that is one of the grand privileges of understanding the Incarnation. But I would suggest that John is an archetype for us. Uh, let, let me explain to you. Um, could you. Could you flash the next one up here? This is just a little fun game I'm going to do. I'm going to replace the word word for Rob. Ready? Okay. See how this feels. In the beginning was Rob. And Rob was with God and Rob was God. Rob was with God in the beginning. Through Rob all things were made. Without Rob nothing was made that has been made. In Rob was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now tell me that doesn't feel awkward. Even for me, to, I'm going to get struck down for doing that right there. <laughs> That's going to be really bad news. Okay, let me do the next one, though. This is the next passage. Ready? I'm going to put Rob in here again. There was a man sent from God whose name was Rob. 
Rob came as a what? Witness. As a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. Rob himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. John the Baptist was a witness to the life of Christ. Interestingly, uh, in I don't think I have this up here. In verse seven, you can see it on that text. Even put John back in there. <laughs> uh, but but he the the apostle John uses a a, a, a root word martus twice in the same sentence. One as a noun and one as a verb. Okay, just just let's do English for a moment. What does a noun do? Someone, any English teachers in here? Anybody even know anything? What is it? <laughs> Sorry, that was an insult. Right. It's 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 actually identifying what, right? I mean, it's uh, like an elephant or whatever, right? I'm just throwing stuff out there right now. But a verb, what's a verb do? Action. It's an action. It's fascinating to me that the Apostle John uses a, a noun for witness, and then he uses a verb for witness in the very next sentence. The first one, this noun, it confers the idea of who John was, not necessarily what he said as a herald, the message of Christ. Uh, we can continually... We are continually witnessing almost as much as we are living. <laughs> That's a joke. We are witnessing in every way that we're living. Every way. Whether you like it or not, you are a witness. It's who you are. I think that's almost uh, a challenging enough place to stop the sermon. You are a witness. You can say, I don't want to witness. Tough. You're a witness. If you're a follower of Christ, you're a witness. And people make assumptions about Jesus, whether it's fair or not, because of you. It's by the way we live. Our lives witness to the light. By the way we handle our money, our generosity, whether we reconcile uh, or not, our communications, our politics, it all is a witness. I love this passage in Matthew, and I'm going to read it from uh, the message translation. This is in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. I think this is the, if, if we're to uh, get a picture of what this is supposed to look like, catch this. Let me tell you why you're here. <clears throat> you're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors in the earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be a light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop on a light stand, shine. Shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people. Ready? And here's the byproduct. You'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. But John wasn't just a witness. He witnessed. The, the NIV says testify, right? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Though we're supposed to stay in our lane, and I made a big deal of that just a moment ago, we are still to testify of who Jesus is. It's, it's commanded. It's told all across the scriptures. So uh, I'm going to turn a corner for one moment and get really practical and try to answer the question, How? Because this is where it gets really weird. Because you're very committed people, you're very convicted about Jesus, and then you just start, like, you know, throwing punches into the dark about how to go about this. That's not it. It's complicated, but it's actually pretty straightforward. Let me render it down to a simple axiom. And I, I hope you remember this. Ready? Tell the truth. 
is tell the truth. T tell the truth. That's what a witness is. <clears throat> you've experienced something, you've seen something, tell the truth about that. And I have a tendency to say more than I know about stuff. <clears throat> I don't know if you guys do that. Like someone asks me a question, and I'll talk, 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 and I'll get to the end of what I actually know, but do I stop? No, I just keep talk, 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 talk. And finally, Rob, in fact, it happened in our life, our uh, four stories group, which, uh, uh, you, remember you asked me a question, and I just kept talking. Finally, Robbie had to go, what he's really trying to say <laughs> <laughs> is one of those, like, you know, just don't keep talking. Talk, just tell people the truth about what you know. You know what you know? Your story. Your story. You don't have to make anything up. You don't have to be tricky. You don't have to convert anybody. You have to tell the truth about your story. Yeah. <coughs> tell your story. My parents have both passed away. And the older I get, the more people around me pass away. That's what happens when you get older. The more people you know die. Yeah. I don't know if you've experienced this, but oftentimes in small group discussions, we are asked if you could spend one day with anyone, past or present, well, who would it be? And these days, the answer for me is always my dad. You know why I'd want to spend time with my dad? Because I want to hear the family story. I, don't, I didn't listen when he was alive. And he has stories for me that I needed to push on into the future to my kids and beyond. We have to be able to tell the story of our lives. Jim, Jim Harrison wrote, death steals everything except our stories. So when you think about, don't, don't complicate it. Don't get it twisted into the, like I've got to read a bunch of apologetics. If you want to, great. But I have, and I'm going to tell you I've never converted anybody. I've never, and no one's ever come to Christ by me knowing more than they did. Never. It, it's not the way it works. Can I give you two pro tips? Here's two pro tips. When you're, when you're testifying, when you're telling people your story, be curious about theirs. Yeah. Treat them like a human. Don't be like the guy at my door who didn't even care who I was. Yeah. Actually listen to their story. You'll learn things. That's number one. Be a curious person. Ask them questions. Don't just tell them. Don't just be a teller. The second thing is, and listen very carefully now, before you tell your story, ask permission. Treat people with honor. I'm, I'm telling you, <clears throat> if you are not a jerk, <laughs> which for me, that's, you know, depends what day it is, uh, but if, if you treat people with honor, if you're curious about them, if you respect them and actually see God's image in them and treat them like humans, um, being curious about their story is part of the package. But the second thing is, just simply ask, hey, would you mind if at some point uh, I could tell you a little bit about this? <clears throat> I, and I don't want to exaggerate like this. I've done it like 50 times or whatever. But I have done that in conversations with people where we're talking and I'm hearing their story, we're becoming friends, and we're out of time. I'm thinking of one person in particular right now. As the time comes to an end, I just go, hey, <coughs> um, I know we have to go, but would you be interested at all of getting together at some point? And I, I'd really like to bring this up if you would be open. And then not be offended if they don't. And don't push it on them if they don't. Yeah. Don't press them. Respect them. But I'll, I'll tell you this. I've never had one person say no. None. If you honor them and respect them and allow them the choice. If the guy came to my door, the story I started with, and said, hey, listen. I know this is an awkward situation, but I, I'd like to have a conversation with you about my experience with God. Would you be interested in hearing that? I might have actually stood there and listened to him. But he didn't have any intention of letting me have a decision in this. Do you understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? By the way, there's another 
There's another word related to all of this. It's, it's the word uh, euangelion. It's, uh, it, it's a compound word in the Greek. It's you would be the idea of good, and uh, angelion is announcement. It's the good news. It's the, when you hear, see the word gospel in the New Testament, that's the word. Listen, our message is good news. Yes. And if it's not good news, then we need to go back to Jesus. And you need to ask a question, like, am, am I sharing good news, or I, am I doing something contrary to that good news? Listen. Um, it's not the summation of the church, but oftentimes the church um, portrays Jesus in a way that he isn't. Uh, we see stuff happening publicly all the time about the church, I mean, you could, we, could, uh, we could go here, and I could ask you what they are, like, oh, pastors falling, in, uh, public pastors falling to sin. Or um, this idea of um, aligning ourselves with a partisan view of politics. I mean, I, I, again, I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole, but the last six or eight years have been so hard for me as I try to share the good news with people. I've had people, mostly 35 and under, tell me if what you're talking about is that, I want no part of it. Honestly, I, I'm, I'm not setting this up. I'm not setting it up. I'm actually trying to talk to people about Christ, and it's been conflated with something that isn't Jesus. Incongruity of our faith. There, there are stories of sacrifice and generosity and goodness and caring for the poor and, and a whole list of things. But you, you guys know this emotionally. Uh, you, there's, there's Teflon and Velcro in your brain. Bad news, negative stuff attaches to you like Velcro. The positive stuff goes into your life and like you have Teflon and it slides away. So really the only thing people remember are the stuff that sticks like the Velcro. Well, that's, that's not fair, but it's the way it is. Let me wrap this up with this. I, I feel like it's my call as a person, I, and um, I hope it's our call as a community, is for us to reimagine what it would be like uh, to think of the world rather than just ourselves. How can we love? What does it look like to be a loving community? What does it look like to be welcoming in and extending goodness and love to others. What does that look like? It's really the thing that drives me in my thinking theologically. I came across this quote this last week by John Stott. This was given in Lausanne. <clears throat> he said this, relating to our present theme of mission, there is the call to the church to live, and I love this word, eccentric, eccentrically. To find its center not in itself, but outside of itself. To turn itself outward to the world, and to be truly a church for others. Such an inside-out revolution would lead to a radical change in the structure of the church. I mean, if, if, if we had time, we could break up into groups of five or six, and we just ask ourselves, okay, what we're doing right here, and just start parsing things out, what we're doing right here, is that solely for us, or is it a gesture to love the world? I believe we're supposed to be a church for the world. I believe that understanding the difference in lanes between calling for conversion or looking to convert people and witnessing to the good news, we have to know those lanes and stay in the one that's ours. It's not our responsibility. It's not our job to convert people. It's our job to be a witness, and it's vital for being a church for the world. Amen? Yes. Amen? Yes. Let me read a, pr a prayer for you, and then I'll invite who's uh, doing the benediction to come forward. This is a prayer called Your Word by Walter Brueggemann. Your word is a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. Your word is, a glue of, is the glue of the universe wherein the whole creation coheres. Your word is the address of promise and command by which we live. 
Your word has come fleshed among us, full of grace and truth. We are creatures of your word, and we give thanks for it. For all that we are, more dazzled that your word is carried, uttered, acted by frail, vulnerable human agents. We ponder and give thanks for those who this day speak your word, where it is desperately needed and deeply resisted. We ponder and give thanks to those who this day act your word for newness and peace and justice. We ponder with trepidation that among us you will yet designate such carriers, such speakers, such actors. In our thanks for your word, we pray for courage in the name of the one who emptied himself, Jesus. Amen. Amen.